Hello everyone, uh, today we are going to talk about hedonism. Uh, this is the second part of our introduction to ethical theories. Now, we have talked about uh, consequentialism, we have talked about consequentialism as uh, the, the uh, uh, a domain in which moral character of an action is judged by the consequences that uh, the action achieves. Now, we uh, in the talk of consequentialism, well we have, uh, we have shifted uh, the uh, moral judgment from the act to the consequences it attains. But notice, we have not talked about what are these kinds of consequences. What is it that describes these consequences? Now, to describe these consequences is the job of a moral theory. So, this consequence is what uh, would rightly be called as good, that uh, any act is in the pursuit of what is good. But the question comes to be that, what is this good? Good within quotation marks. Now, attaining the good, as I read, is a part of consequentialism, that is an action. Attaining the good is a part of consequentialism, that is, an action is right, if the consequences aimed or achieved are good. Now, are we uh, substituting consequences with good? But, is this explaining what consequences, uh, what good is? Hedonism is a theory, which tries to uh, answer this question, that what is the nature of good. So, it is explaining or defining what is the good. And I put it within inverted commas, because it talks about the concept good. Now, but then, what is the content of this good? or what is the description of this good? Hedonism proposes an answer to this question. It says that the good is, uh, that pleasure is the good, the true goal of every living being, and what everyone ought to aim at. Now, as we see, hedonism talks about the true goal of every living being and what everyone ought to aim at. The key word here to remember is pleasure. Now, is pleasure the same thing as good? Now, the hedonist claim is that, well, uh, attaining pleasure or happiness, there may be a difference between the two, but for the moment, let us assume them in the same bracket, that attaining pleasure or happiness is what we are naturally equipped with, and this is our aim. Now, what are uh, pleasures? Now, pleasures or happiness seems to be a, a natural uh, phenomena that we are equipped with. The ability to uh, feel or know pleasures is almost introspective. And uh, hedonism goes ahead to claim that, well, this uh, immediate implicit knowledge of what is pleasurable or what is happiness inducing, either in the short run or the long run, is uh, what ought to be the parameter for determining what is good. Now, the text referred is William Frankena, and on the page 84, he pr brings about some contentions about uh, pleasures. I read, only pleasures are intrinsically good, or whatever is pleasant in itself, is good in itself. A hedonist may admit that some pleasures are morally bad or wrong, or that some, or that some are bad because of their results. Now, this is to be noted. Only pleasures are intrinsically good, or whatever is pleasant in itself, is good in itself. A hedonist may admit that some pleasures are morally bad or wrong, or that some are bad because of their results. Now, this is a contention of, uh, as put out by Frankena. Now, the gist of which is saying that, pleasure or happiness is the final standard, uh, the desired final or perpetual consequence. Now, 
is pleasure the final standard? What is hedonism saying? Hedonism is trying to put forth that well, if, if we have the ability, the natural ability to know uh, when we are happy about something or when we are not happy about something. This is a natural index uh, which we are equipped with and this natural index is the foundation of moral judgment. This natural index will decide what is right or what is wrong. So, what this uh, uh, the hedonist is saying, he is trying to bring about the relation between two notions, two notions which are good and happiness or pleasure. Now, what is the relation that is going to be between these uh, two notions, good and happiness and pleasure. Now, whether it is that of equivalence or of definition or it is not equivalent, that is what is to be determined. Now, the hedonist says that well, whatever is good is pleasurable and whatever is pleasurable is good. So, in a way there is a relation between the two in that uh, anything that is to be termed as good has to be pleasurable and anything that is pleasurable has to be uh, a part of the domain good. So, there is a kind of interactive relation between the two that uh, between good and happiness and pleasure. So, anything that is good, anything that is good is also pleasurable and anything that is pleasurable is also good. So, now standing of these two claims 1 and 2 and that they are uh, uh, almost being uh, able to be interchanged vice versa, this brings about a kind of uh, definition to good. However, the hedonist stops short of defining the good as that which brings happiness, but this brings a such a strong correlation that it is almost of an equivalence. Now, if the hedonist is true, what the hedonist is saying that there cannot be something which can, uh, is good and is not pleasurable in short or long run. So, this is the essential claim that there cannot be something which is good and is not pleasurable in the short or long run. Now, this is the claim of the uh, hedonist that everything that is that, that the uh, 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 happiness is the final standard that we can by which we can judge. Uh, things to be good or consequences or uh, moral acts to be good. Now, keep in uh, mind that the uh, next theory that we talk about is utilitarianism and the utilitarianism also subscribes to hedonism, where it claims that well, uh, happiness is pursued. Notice we are not talking about the domain of the agent, that happiness for whom, for how many, happiness for uh, in the short run or in the long run or happiness over vis a vis pleasure or satisfaction. So, these are uh, uh, broader areas, but what now as uh, a student of uh, hedonism we need to know is that uh, it talks about our natural uh, ability to have a preferential hierarchy between what may be broadly termed as happiness, pleasure, uh, satisfaction and what we morally call good. Now, getting a relation between these two is the hedon uh, ethos of the hedonist claim. 
Now, let us read what is on the slide. Pleasantness is the criteria of intrinsic goodness. It is what makes things good as ends. It is not just a coincidence that what is pleasant is good in itself and vice versa. This is again from our textbook. Now, what is this claim saying? It is saying that pleasantness is the criteria of intrinsic goodness. Intrinsic goodness meaning valuable in itself. It is what makes things good as ends. It is not just a coincidence that what is pleasant is good in itself and vice versa. So, here Frankena's version of hedonism is claiming that what is pleasant is good in itself and vice versa. That means, there can be nothing that which is not good and yet pleasant. right? So, what is this fundamental claim denying? It is denying one good, but not pleasurable and two pleasurable, but not good. So, it is trying to claim that well we are, it is denying that there can be nothing which can be termed good, but is not pleasurable and something nothing can be termed pleasurable or pleasant as in the archaic language used, which is pleasant or pleasurable and yet not good either in the short run or the long run. So, our ability to have to distinguish between uh, natural, uh, our natural ability to distinguish between happiness and uh, pain is also our ability to distinguish between what is good and what is not good. Now, as we uh, put up in the last sentence that there can be nothing which can be regarded as good and is neither pleasant by itself or in the consequence it brings about. So, for anything to be good, it has to be either pleasant by itself or it has to bring about pleasantness. So, only with these two characteristics can something be called good. So, therefore, there can be nothing which is good, but not pleasurable. Now, a few questions that we need to tackle that we have uh, talked about the domain of pleasures. right? We have talked about pleasures and many of you would be wondering right now, that I have loosely or uh, uh, used pleasure, happiness, pleasant, satisfaction uh, interchangeably. Now, this is for a reason, this is for a reason, because uh, the hedonist, uh, what you might have uh, got an impression is particularly the indulgent pleasure seeker. But hedonism as a philosophical principle is just claiming happiness. Now, that happiness can be uh, interpreted in terms of satisfaction, can be interpreted in terms of pleasure. So, giving it a wider domain that well, uh, some pleasures can be called, uh, say in, can fall in the domain of satisfaction, some pleasures can fall in the domain of happiness, some are downright uh, pleasures. So, what about making a category or what about making uh, a different scale of valuation for different pleasures, as we see here that the question that we ask is, are all pleasures of the same value, right? How can we grade pleasures? Now, using the term happiness is uh, rather ambiguous, because it gives a scope of a lot of uh, interpretation, right? Now, as the hedonist is uh, the creature of the senses, that is, uh, not in a derogatory fashion being the creature of the senses, the uh, hedonist is actually uh, saying that our sensory apparatus enables us to distinguish between uh, a happy or a pleasant state of affair from an unpleasant state of affair. And that becomes our uh, parameter to distinguish from a, a, a good state of affair to a and a not good or a bad state of affairs. right? Now, how can uh, pleasures be graded? Now, this you might like to know and perhaps those who would like to explore hedonism in greater detail can uh, take the talks of or can go ahead with these leads that we will come across right now. So, coming to the slide, what the, there is a broadly classification between quantitative and qualitative 
hedonists, quantitative and qualitative hedonists. Quantitative hedonists like Bentham maintain that the goodness of an um, activity is proportional to the quantity of pleasure it contains. But our question is, can pleasure be quantified? When Bentham is making a claim that uh, uh, goodness of an activity is proportional to the quantity of the pleasure it contains. But Bentham tried to work about a quantification of pressure and it, uh, of pleasure, but it does not have to be such a systematic uh, uh, calculation. Consider it this way, giving the benefit of doubt to uh, or, or, or uh, trying to make an empathetic understanding of the hedonist, the quantitative hedonist. He, look at it this way, suppose uh, uh, as a governmental body, one has to decide between electrifying a village and providing portable water to another village. Providing uh, portable uh, uh, water to a village is higher in bringing about general state of uh, happiness or providing electricity is more important in, uh, in getting a better state of happiness. So, it is this kind of a calculation that uh, Bentham would talk about, that there is a gradation. It does not have to be very accurately numerical. It also includes, uh, people have tried to bring a very numerical uh, uh, attached numbers to pleasures, but by quantitative it is meant that we make distinctions uh, or gradations in the uh, amount of pleasure that can be contained in it. Now, the second pleasure, uh, uh, second qualification that is talked about is qualitative hedonists. Now, the Mill is one such hedonist. Qualitative hedonists hold that pleasures differ uh, in kind or quality. For example, pleasures differ in kind or quality. For example, the mental pleasures may exceed in value to physical pleasures. So, uh, Mill was a more refined hedonist. Mill's claim starts out to be that, well, pleasures can be qualified into either uh, physical, mental, where there can be various classifications. And therefore, uh, the, uh, it is not just in the quantity of uh, uh, pleasure uh, that we can make gradations, but there are also kinds of pleasures. Now, the kind of pleasure would determine what kind of uh, hierarchy we set about it. Now, let us encounter another classification of hedonism between, which is psychological hedonism and ethical hedonism. Now, psychological hedonism is a descriptive doctrine, that is it describes a state of affair. It describes a state of affair, whereas the ethical hedonism prescribes a course of action or an ideal or normative state of affair. Now, let me read. Psychological hedonism is uh, claiming that, well, it is human nature to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Fairly simple. Ethical hedonism, on the other hand, reads, humans ought to seek pleasure and avoid pain. Now, the difference between the two is in the word ought. This is a state of, is a description. This is a prescription. Of psychological hedonism describes the way things are. It is a descriptive thesis uh, and uh, ethical hedonism is a prescriptive thesis. It, it prescribes the way things should be. It is a normative thesis. Now, some things you might like to know that if ethical hedonism is true, there it implies that uh, psychological hedonism also becomes true, right? Ethical hedonism true, psychological hedonism becomes true. But psychological hedonism being true does not mean that uh, ethical hedonism is true, right? So, uh, psychological hedonism is just a description of state of affairs, whereas ethical hedonism is a prescription how things ought to be. Now, having said this, 
let us see what is or what could be the problem with hedonism. Now, people like Moore, G. E. Moore, a famous philosopher, have uh, argued that the hedonists make an illegitimate inference from this is the premise to the conclusion. From the premise that pleasure and pleasure alone is desired as an end, to that pleasure and pleasure alone is good as an end. So, from what is desired to becoming what is good, is this legitimate. Now, again this again leads from the normative descriptive claim that we talked about. Now, uh, if we see that well, uh, pleasure is, we seek pleasure naturally, that is a factual state of affair. Now, our seeking pleasure naturally, does it become uh, also uh, that we ought to seek pleasure? That is where uh, the illegitimate inference difference is brought to light by G. E. Moore, that hedonists make an illegitimate jump from what is the case to what ought to be the case. So, uh, what is desired as an end and uh, what is desired as an end and what is good, they cannot be linked or there is no reason to see why one leads to the other. Now, there are some, some more uh, issues that we need to talk about that let us, let me, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example, let us talk about it, let us do a thought experiment. Let us assume that there is a, 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 a hedon machine, as a philosopher has uh, conjectured that, uh, uh, or let us say that we have something called virtual reality and that we are plugged into a virtual reality machine, having all the pleasures or having the sensation of all the pleasures that we want and our life, our bodies are on a life support system and they survive and our life continues to be the string of pleasures that they are. Now, this seems to be uh, uh, a, 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 a tricky situation. Are we going to be as happy as we think we would be? Would you like to sit or be plugged into this virtual reality machine? you could have all the pleasures that you would uh, uh, require, but would you call the life a happy life? Because it uh, brings forth a deeper question, a question that is a comfortable life and a meaningful life. What is the relation between these two? Now, pleasure is, uh, when, when you are plugged into the virtual reality machine, you have all the uh, sensations and the pleasures that you would require, but on a cumulative effect, does this lead to a happier state of affairs? Many of you would be uh, appalled by the idea of this virtual reality machine and you would not consider uh, being plugged into that machine, at least not for life. Whereas there is something that is preventing you from uh, uh, feeling this as the measure of happiness. Now, those who are thinking that, well, uh, this machine, I do not want to uh, be plugged into this virtual reality machine, are implicitly non-hedonists. That is, they are, uh, uh, to them, uh, it, is, uh, it is clear that somebody who, who does something uh, uh, what he thinks is morally or uh, ethically right, has a certain sense of satisfaction, a certain sense of happiness uh, or accomplishment, accomplishment for that. Say, why does Mother Teresa, if I ask Mother Teresa that, why have you been uh, uh, sacrificing your comfortable life and uh, working so hard and uh, giving up pleasures to serve the poor? Our country, India is full of examples of uh, such, such uh, uh, people. But then, what would Mother Teresa or any other saint in this matter reply? That, do I do it for the happiness I seek or 
as we have written here, that the pleasure or the happiness or the satisfaction that we get is an accompaniment or a side effect or a byproduct okay now uh, let us read what is written on the slide pleasure as an accompaniment or side effect or a byproduct of our uh, objectives and not the objective itself now why this idea of being plugged into a virtual reality machine seems to be appalling to many. It is because, we are not targeting the happiness perhaps, or the pleasure that comes along, or even the cumulative satisfaction that comes along. We need to do the, uh, what is good, not because it brings along satisfaction, but because it is good and satisfaction comes along with it. Now, this is the kind of an uh, argument that the non-hedonist would make, that uh, the hedonist stands uh, falsified, when he claims that all that we do is because it gets us satisfaction, and only those things that get us satisfaction are things that can be called good. So, is good, the second question that we come up, is good the desired consequence, or does the desired consequence become a good. Now, I will leave this question to you, as uh, an audience, uh, that is uh, the, uh, what we desire, does it make something good, that something is desired, x is desired, therefore x is good, or x is good, because x is desired. Now, if your answer is latter, that is, x is good, and therefore it is desired, uh, then you are a non uh, uh, hedonist. But if your claim is that x is uh, desired, and therefore x is good, then that is an hedonistic claim. So, uh, hedonism is an essential, is an, is an uh, interesting on, and uh, primary mode or impulse in human behavior, that when it tries to naturalize human behavior to how we are equipped to come across life, that our choices of uh, our ability as sentient creatures to prefer uh, pleasure over pain, to pl prefer uh, pleasure and to shun pain, is a, a natural part of us, and that is what should be perhaps the basis of a moral theory, that any act is moral, only if it brings about the satisfaction. The utilitarian takes it further, says that well, it increases the number of agents, that it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number. We will be talking about that theory next. Uh, so, the hedonist in essence is making one hierarchy clear, that we prefer pleasure over pain, and this alone is the fundamental for making a moral judgment, or making an ethical claim. Now, uh, the hedonist therefore, can uh, denies, that there can be anything that is, uh, can be, uh, which is, can be called good, and is neither pleasurable in the short run, nor in the long run. So, with this, we come to an end of uh, the topic of hedonism, which is a fundamental uh, moral uh, ethos, uh, in most traditions, be it the Charvakas in the Indian philosophical tradition, or the Epicureans in Greek tradition. So, uh, this is a very fundamental drive, where it is trying to naturalize human beings into the creatures that they are, and also as a rebellion to the uh, extraordinary uh, tenets of morality, perhaps uh, founded on religion, which constantly restrict uh, the natural preference order of human beings.